Well, good morning, CIPC and everybody watching us this morning. We really appreciate you joining in to our videos. We are in week 10 of lockdown. Oh my goodness. Uh, they've extended the lockdown time. So uh, we're going to have three more weeks like this. And uh, again, we'll continue this probably through the month of June with the videos. And then I plan to be in the United States for July and August. And uh, so we'll see what we do in July and August. Maybe I can come to you by video <laughs> from America a little bit. We'll see. Uh, but anyway, let me get into the announcements today. And then we're going to get into our 10th message in the book of Philippians. And we're going to have a great Sunday together. So, so glad you're joining us. Don't forget to join Kids Church, especially those of you that have kids. Now, if you don't have kids and you just want to see Sister Carol, go over there and click on those videos. Sister Carol had a bad accident this week. She took the bicycle out for a ride. We try and get out and exercise every day. And so she took the bicycle out and she hit a puppy and then she hit the pavement. And uh, so her face is messed up, her wrist is messed up, uh, her elbow, uh, her hip. And so at any rate, uh, she's asked Sister Mandy if she can do something for Kids Church. So you might have Sister Mandy this week, but we'll have a Kids Church this week. So check out that video. And if you've missed any of the previous ones, go on to our uh, YouTube channel and check those out. We have our preaching of all those 10 sermons. We have them in French. So if you don't understand me real good in English, we have them with French translation. Uh, and then we have uh, Sister Carol's Kids Church videos. So check all those out and uh, enjoy those. Uh, if you've missed any of the messages, uh, go back and, and watch them all because this is a series and we're going through the book of Philippians. So if you've just uh, come on here at number 10 or 8 or 9 or whatever, or you've hit some and missed some, go back and watch all of them all the way through. It might be a good devotional for you to do one of them a day for the next 10 days uh, because it's about the joy of the Lord and we need to have the joy uh, even in this lockdown. Amen. So uh, again, we're on lockdown. We hope uh, it's, it's supposed to end June the 10th. And so we're hoping we can have church on June 14th. So mark your calendars that we'll be planning on church for June 14th. We don't know what that will mean. If that will be, uh, they've talked about step down. So if they say only 50 can meet, then we'll have to make arrangements for that. And so make sure you're checking out our Facebook and that you are on our email uh, announcement list. If you are not on that list, send us an email at cipcassist at gmail.com. We'll put you on the list. Then we can tell you, hey, we're having church on Sunday, but here's the restrictions or here's the deal. So uh, at any rate, make sure you're aware of that. Be praying for us. Be praying for June 14th that we can get together. All right. Uh, food delivery. So we said this week was our last week for food deliveries, but because of the extension, we'll be doing three more food deliveries on May 25th, uh, June the 1st, and June 8th. And so if you need food, let us know and we will put you on the list and uh, we will try and make a food delivery to you. As I said, for the first eight weeks, uh, we didn't turn anyone down. In week nine, we did ask a few people to call uh, a couple other different numbers and see if they could get help. And so we didn't hear back from them. So I'm trusting they, they did get help from someone else. Um, but anyway, we're delivering a lot of food and we're glad to help, but we may not, from this point forward, may not get them all. So if we tell you that, we're really sorry, but we're doing all that we can. So if you need food, give me a call, 06 69 or email me, casaipc at gmail.com. And uh, we'll, again, we'll put you on the list and we'll, we'll definitely try and get to you. So let me know if you need food. All right. Uh, our new website. Again, thank you for all those who have visited our new website. If you haven't yet, please check out our new website. And uh, if you get any comments, let me know. But uh, I think it looks good. It's sharp. It suits the purpose of what our main goal with the website for people searching for our church, that they can find us and join us and be a part of CIPC. So uh, we've got our map on there. We've got a little bit about who we are. We have all of our staff listed on there. So anyway, nice website. Uh, for our worship this week, uh, I want to encourage you again, uh, visit Air One. We'll have that link again below. I got a lot of good comments from that. Some people wrote and said, wow, pastor, that's awesome. I never knew that site existed. And so some people really enjoyed that. So if you didn't do that, check out Air One. It's really great because you can put it on your phone so you can listen in the car. Uh, you can listen to it on walk with your, your earbuds. Uh, you can 
can listen to it in your home. Uh, you don't have to just have it on your phone on the, the app, but you can bring up their website and again, listen on your computer or connect that to a sound system in your house and, and listen to worship all the time. So it's a great thing to have on. Whenever I'm in my office, I, I have it on so I can just listen and, and worship the Lord. Also gonna highlight for you some different groups instead of different songs. I thought uh, there's only a handful of people that are really putting out a lot of the new worship music. And so I'm going to highlight those for you. So the first one this week is uh, Bethel, Bethel Music. So we'll have uh, a link to the YouTube ch channel for Bethel Music. So check out Bethel Music this week, and you'll probably recognize some of those songs. We do some of them in our church and uh, some great stuff. Uh, giving, thank you again for giving. Uh, last week, I preached a message on the joy of stewardship. And I said, as God blesses you with more, you should want to give more. In other words, our goal is never to become the tither, but that's the starting place. Our goal is to become the generous person, the generous Christian, uh, a real giver. Amen. And so that's what we want to become. So I'm going to read a scripture to you today out of 2 Corinthians 9, verses 10 and 11. It says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply, look at this, and multiply your seed for sowing. Now, he's using a term there about farming, right? Seed, sowing, putting it in the ground. But it appears he's talking about money. He who supplies seed to the sower, he who supplies finances to the giver, and bread for food and meets your needs, he will also supply, that means he's going to give you more, he's going to help you increase more, and multiply your seed, multiply your money, cause your money in your life to increase. Now again, uh, don't take this scripture too far in the wrong direction, that it's like we're all supposed to get rich, but it's that God does bless as we give so that we can give more, and that's exactly what it says next. He's going to multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Righteousness means right doing. That means that he's going to increase your capacity for doing right, for doing good. Why? Because you're going to have more money or more resources of some type. And the more resources you have, the more good you can do. You can't become more righteous because Jesus made us completely righteous. Amen. But he's going to increase your righteous acts because he's going to increase your, your uh, resources. He said, you will be enriched in every way for all liberality. There's the term, all liberality. Not, not he's going to give you money so that you can tithe. <laughs> he's going he's gonna to increase you so that you'll be enriched in all liberality. Uh, I think it says in Ephesians that you should work hard with your hands so that you have money so that you can give to every good work. That we want to participate every time we have the opportunity. So uh, let me read that again. You'll be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through you is producing thanksgiving to God. So you see how that happens? If you give, he says he'll give you more. Now we talked about it last week, so don't take my words out of context. We shouldn't give to get, but it is a principle. As you give, you'll receive. So he says you give, you're going to receive more. The one who supplies seed for your sowing, he's going to increase that. Why? so that it will increase your righteousness. You'll do more righteous deeds and you'll be enriched in all liberality. You'll go past the tither and you'll be a generous person. And then that's gonna produce thanksgiving to God. First in your life, that you're thankful that you can participate in the work of God by helping other people. That's the work of God, amen? And then it's gonna increase thanksgiving to God, not just from you, but when you help others, they say, Thanks be to God. Do you know as we give food, so many people say thank you to us and they say thank you to God, amen? And so it's increasing thanksgiving to God. So hallelujah. So I hope you'll do that. I hope you set that goal in your life, not to be a tither, but to exceed that and be a generous person. Well, prayer, keep praying for me, keep praying for CIPC, keep praying for uh, the world leaders of your nation as well as the nation of Morocco that we can get through this. Well, we have... This week, a special song from John and Penny Gooch. Uh, many of you know them, and if, uh, if the travel restriction lifts, uh, they're going to be coming into Morocco and going to be with you in services in July and August. And so I hope you'll be praying for that and looking forward to their visit. But at any rate, they did a little song for us. And so here, take a listen and worship the Lord with them, and I'll be right back and we'll get into the preaching of the Word. Rejoice and sing, the Lord is King. Rejoice and sing, 
Thank you, John and Penny, for doing that. I hope you enjoyed that song from them. They're such a great couple. They love Jesus, and, and we love them, and we're so glad they're going to be with us uh, again in July and August. So, well, let's get into the Word today. So turn off your phones. If you got your phone, shut it off or put it on silent. Uh, move, remove distractions so you can just focus on the Word today. If you want a cup of coffee, grab a cup of coffee before we start. And let's get into the Word. Well, open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And uh, we're going to be looking at the last three verses of Philippians chapter 4, which is the end of the book of Philippians. So let's read just the very first part of verse 21. Philippians 4.21a. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Let's pray as we begin this time together. Father, I thank you again that we can come together by video. I thank you for the CIPC Church and uh, all those that attend and all those that are connecting with us by video from all over the world. We're so thankful that we can connect this way, Lord. I pray you would strengthen the church in this difficult time and that very soon you would bring us back together and you would help us to adapt to whatever the restrictions might be, but that we would come together to bring glory to you. And Lord, may we bring glory to you in this country. May we be your light and your love uh, in this nation. Today, as we look into the very end of the book of Philippians, would you just anoint the preaching of your word, open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. Hallelujah. All right, hope you said amen with me. Well, we're in a series uh, ending. Today's the last sermon, 10th sermon in the book of Philippians. And our theme has been Philippians 4.4. Can you say it with me? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Hallelujah. So we're supposed to be a rejoicing people. So our theme has been joy or, or our uh, uh, title of our series has been joy. And we've gone through 10 sermons. So uh, again, I, today we don't have time to review all of those. If you missed any of them, again, go back, watch the video. But let's just real quick. Number one was the joy of sharing. Uh, number two, the joy of struggling. Number three, the joy of serving. Number four, the joy of sacrificing. Number five, the joy of salvation. Number six, the joy of sanctification. Number seven, the joy of safety and security. Number eight, the joy of satisfaction. And then number nine, last Sunday, the joy of stewardship. And uh, let me just review that one real quick. As followers of Jesus, we simply said that we give everything to the Lord. So we're talking about giving. We've already given 100% to Jesus. Amen? 
And, and so the things that we have, the things we possess, my phone, my coffee cup, my computer, my clothes, maybe if you own a home, I just rent a home, but if you own a home, a car, uh, your Bible, a tablecloth, I mean everything, everything we own, the money in our pocket or the money in the bank, everything, 100%, belongs to Jesus, amen? Because we've given him our life. We, we've given him everything. And so everything we possess, we are now managers of those resources for Jesus. They're his, and we wanna manage them well. So we manage them as if they belong to someone else because they do, we've given them to him. And so this is our life, is to manage the things of the Lord. And when we do, we should have the joy of stewardship because we should have the confidence that if everything's the Lord, I don't need to worry about it. If it's broken, I can take it to the Lord in prayer. Lord, your computer's broken. <laughs> Lord, I need it to keep doing the work you've asked me to do. Can you help me figure out how to fix it or get a new one, right? Same with your car. Same with anything. If you need something, you ask the Lord. You know that if everything's the Lord, you're going to have everything you need. He's going to supply all of your need. And that was our verse was Philippians 4.19, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches, not according to the economy. Oh, it's coronavirus, the economy's in trouble. No, he didn't say I'm going to supply according to the economy of the world. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So being a steward should bring us great joy. Well, let's get into our message today which is the joy of sainthood. That's the title of our message today, the joy of sainthood. Philippians 4, 21a says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Greet everyone. Well, let's start out today with talking about what is a saint? Greet every saint? Well, what's a saint? How do I know how to greet a saint? What's a saint? Well, in the Catholic Church, uh, uh, they named saints as martyrs and notable leaders. And so when someone was great as a Christian, great follower of Jesus, some great preacher or, you know, the apostles and uh, again, just greats. I don't know what other word to use. Or they were martyred. They died for their faith. They were executed for being a Christian. They named these people saints. Well, in 1234, the Catholic Church, I think they realized they were calling many saints and they said, we got to come up with some criteria for this. And so uh, I'm not Catholic, so I don't know the details of that criteria, but they have a criteria for what they call a saint. And so some of it has to do with did they uh, perform or receive some type of verifiable, verifiable miracle? Um, did they have some particular grace or a favor bestowed upon their life that was uh, clearly, um, I don't know what word to use, abnormal, above normal, <laughs> super normal. <laughs> um, and so did they have something like this? Did they leave an, a, live an exemplary life? Uh, did they hold to good doctrinal uh, teaching and practices and writings? And so, and then, and then all that information, so they study that person. First, in the Catholic Church, you can't be a, one of these types of saints until you die, so it's only for the dead. And then they look back over their life, and then they also then submit all this information, I think, to a couple different boards who review it. And then they decide, yes, this person's a saint, or no, this person's not a saint. Well, I, I don't really have a problem with, with what they do. I'm not here today to try and counter that. But what the Bible says is a saint, and this idea of sainthood in the Catholic Church are two different things. And I wish the Catholic Church would have used a different word, um, maybe super saint. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it, it, what they're saying is completely different than the way the word the Bible uses the word saint. So, so at any rate, so that's the Catholic's definition of saint or of the sainthood. But also, if you go to um, Catholic education, you will also find that they do use the biblical term of saint for, which we'll get to in a minute, which means every believer, every follower of Jesus is a saint. And so the Catholic Church does hold to that teaching as well. So they use these two words uh, or the same word for two different meanings. And so a little bit confusing. So I only brought that up to say when we're talking about saints today that we're not 
talking about that kind of saint. We're not talking about the martyr. We're not talking about someone who's already gone before us, who's led a faithful life. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Well, the world's definition uh, of a saint, the way they, they see the word, is a very virtuous person. Not just a virtuous person, a very virtuous person. Uh, someone who lives a sinless life. So we know right there that person doesn't even exist, right? Uh, and then and they also said a person having an exceptional degree of holiness, an exceptional degree of holiness. So again, I don't know who that really defines, but that's what the world sees as a saint, someone who's living basically a sinless life, kind of a perfect kind of person, which again, don't know who they are beyond Jesus. Uh, the Bible definition, now if we go back to the Greek, is the word hegeos, hegeos, and it means most holy one, <laughs> right? So we would, we would only apply that to Jesus, but guess what? The Bible applies that word hegeos to me and to you. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you've prayed a prayer and you've declared yourself a uh, Christian or you've declared yourself, I'm going to follow Jesus with my life. You're Hegeos. You're most holy one. Hallelujah. Wow. Now you might not feel most holy. Well, I sinned yesterday. I don't feel most holy. Well, you know what? It's not about feeling. It's about what is. And what the Bible says is, is that you are a saint. Amen. If you're a follower of Jesus. So Paul basically define sainthood for us in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. Let me read that to you. He says, to the church of God, this is the beginning of the, the letter, and so he's, he's uh, introducing or greeting them. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints called by God, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So he starts this book saying, this is who I'm talking to. And he lists one of those as saints. But if you'll look at this verse, he's not talking to four different groups. He's not talking about subgroups within the church. These are the four things he says he's, he's addressing. So he says, to the church, here's who I'm writing to, the church, to those who are sanctified in Christ, to saints, and to all who call upon the name of the Lord. Let me tell you, those aren't four different groups of people. Those are all the same group of people. That is one group. So if we extract the word saint from this verse, we can use the remainder of the verse to define this word saint. Does that make sense? So we're taking the word saint out and we're going to use rest of the verse then to say that it's, it's basically addressing that thing. So it leaves three then. So he gave four, it leaves three. So those three will amplify what a saint is. So number one, he says to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Now we can remove Corinth also because we're talking about worldwide. Now we're not talking about one geographical location. So he's talking about those who are in the church. So first is the larger body of believers that we call the church. That's the church worldwide. Doesn't mean you're a member of a particular denomination or even a particular church. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are a member of the church, amen? So that's the church. There's one church and there's many churches. That word's kind of like the word saint, isn't it? <laughs> we use the same word to mean uh, two, two radically different things. So at any rate, so the church worldwide is all believers, living and dead. Uh, that's the church, amen? Uh, and we refer to that later as that's the bride of Christ. So that's the church. So he says group number one, the church. And then I would say also that if you want to say, are you a saint? Not only are you a part of the big church, but are you a part of the little church? Are you a member of an individual church? Are you a, a member of a local body of believers? So that's number one for being a saint. Number two for being a saint, those who are sanctified in Christ. Now, if you missed our message on sanctification, go back and listen to that. But we talked about the joy of sanctification, and we talked about there's, there's three sanctifications, but two in relation to what we're talking about here. One, you gave your life to Jesus and you were sanctified. You were set apart for the purposes of God. Number two is the ongoing process of sanctification, and that means growing in holiness, that we want to live our lives a holy way. 
we recognize our mistakes, we sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and we are in a lifelong process of changing our lives, of trying to be more and more like Jesus. So number one, you're in the church. Number two, you are clearly in the process of pursuing holiness, of becoming a sanctified person. And then number three, he says that they are the ones who have called on the name of the Lord, that they are saved, they're born again, they're new creatures in Christ. So have you called upon the name of the Lord? So again, this verse defines for us, if a person's a follower of Jesus, they are a saint, amen? If we go over to Romans, Paul, again, the author of Romans, is very clear in addressing all the church. So let's look at that, Romans chapter one, verse seven. He says, to all, can you say that with me? All, <laughs> to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. Notice, all called as saints. He doesn't say to the two or three people in Rome who are saints or who are going to be saints. He says, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. And then he gives them the greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we could continue going through the Bible and looking at the places where the word saint appears, um, but you will find that it's very clear in the Bible that the word saint is referring to every follower of Jesus, from the ones who gave their life to Jesus today to ones who gave their life to Jesus 50 years ago, it doesn't matter. Some are living very holy lives for the Lord. Some just got saved and their lives are still really messed up and they're still full of all kinds of sins that God has yet to work out of their lives. So they're both saints. They're both saints. Why? Because God called them, Jesus cleansed them, and Jesus is working on them. Is Jesus still working on you? We used to sing a little song and said, God's still working on me. <laughs> God's not finished with me yet. Well, he's not finished with me. He's not finished with you. He's still working on us. And so he's working on us to bring us to that place where we're closer and closest to Jesus. Well, let's look in our Bibles um, uh, Philippians 4, 21a again, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. So a saint is a follower of Jesus. I'm a saint, you're a saint. Can you say that right now? I'm a saint, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm a saint, I'm a follower of Jesus. Praise the Lord, amen. Well, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Clearly, again, he's not talking about greeting dead people. He's clearly not talking about greeting just a small subgroup of the church or the two or three super Christians who get labeled as saints. No, he's saying greet every Christian. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Now with COVID-19, what does that mean? <laughs> another place, Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. <laughs> and of course, here in Morocco, it's very common, you know, do a little bizu, you know, cheek to cheek. Uh, but now with COVID-19, we can't be doing that, amen? And so uh, when we get together, when we do get together, I think we gotta go for like the elbow bump, right? You just you just click the other person's elbow. Hey man, how you doing? I greet you in the name of the Lord, amen? So, but let's not, not greet each other. Let's greet, we just gotta change our greeting a little bit. No more handshaking, no more to be zoo. And hopefully this thing will pass and you can get back to those more intimate greetings. But until then, the elbow bump, the hey, how you doing? And God bless you and I greet you. All right, let's go on to the second part of that verse, Philippians 4.21b, the second half. So he says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus, and the brethren who are with me greet you. Wow. You know, we come through, when we read the Bible like this, and we come to the end of the chapter, and we hear Paul say, oh, greet every saint, and the brothers who are with me greet you. And we just read over that. I don't even think about it. Think about what that means. Paul. The brethren who are with me greet you. The brethren who are with me. Where is Paul? Paul's in prison. He's talking about people in prison who have now given their lives to Jesus Christ. He's given them a tremendous testimony. Hey, well, I've been in prison a whole bunch of these guys got saved. This guy's a murderer. This guy's a thief. That guy was a rapist. Man, they're my brothers now. They've given their life to Jesus. They were some of the most notorious criminals. Some are getting out of here. Some are getting executed. But they're followers of Jesus. Wow. And so he says, the brethren who are with me 
Church, they greet you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, let's go on to verse 22. First part of 22, he says, all the saints greet you. So again, Paul's not referring to people who have died, but he's referring again to those he called brothers. So notice that. The brethren who are with me greet you. And then he says, all the saints greet you. Paul's just being repetitive. He's saying the same thing. These guys who are murderers and rapists and thieves and notorious criminals, they're now my brothers. And they're not just my brothers. They're now saints. <laughs> Hallelujah. They're saints. Jesus has washed away all their sin. Oh, the government maybe hasn't forgiven them. As I said, some of those guys might have been getting ready to get executed. Their crimes were so heinous, they're going to execute them. But you know what? Jesus forgives it all. Hallelujah. Washes it away. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. They might not get saved from the execution, but they're saved from their sin. And they can go to the execution with confidence that they're going on to see Jesus that very moment for to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah. And so Paul says, the, my brothers, they greet you. All the saints, they greet you. Hallelujah. And so uh, I love over, you know, we got to remember who we are, church. Amen. Go over to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And a uh, great passage there. Uh, let's look down uh, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor the drunkard, nor the revilers, nor the swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. And this is the part I want you to see. And such were some of you. <laughs> Church, don't forget, that's who you're made up of. You're made up of all the worst, amen? Now, some of you grew up in good homes and you lived good moral lives and you've joined the church and you're serving Jesus and praise the Lord. I'm glad you didn't go through that life. But so many in the church, we've come out of a real garbage lifestyle and we've come into the kingdom of God. And now we're brothers and sisters and we're children of God and we're saints, hallelujah. We're not saints because of our behavior. We're not saints because of our past record. We're saints because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you and for me. Amen. So look at that in verse 11. He's so <laughs> Paul's being very blunt to the church. And such were some of you. But that word were is so key there. Such were some of you. But you were washed. Somebody say hallelujah. But you were sanctified. Praise the Lord. But you were justified. Made just as if I'd never sinned justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Wow. So uh, I read that to you just to remind us, Paul's talking to the church here in Philippi. I'm sure they could be a little bit shocked. Okay, these guys in prison are now my brothers. This guy murdered my, my you know, whatever. Um, my brother, my mom, my dad, my best friend. And that guy's my brother now. Yeah, that guy's your brother now. That guy's a saint now. So that can be hard to swallow. But he's telling the church, these guys are my brothers. These guys are now saints. And uh, back there in 1 Corinthians, and uh, such were some of you. Amen. Uh, and so Paul's telling them, but now I got these new brothers in the Lord. Okay, Philippians 22, uh, the second part of that verse uh, so he says, all the saints greet you. And then he lays another heavy one on him. Especially those of Caesar's household. Wow. He lays a bomb on him. Uh, come on, Paul. What are you talking about? How could someone in Caesar's household be a saint? <laughs> They didn't think very much of Caesar, you know? Uh, and so, like, oh my gosh, how could somebody of Caesar's household, how, Paul, how can you be calling this person a saint? And so Paul's letting the church know that in his imprisonment, his, prison, his imprisonment has been incredibly productive. 
During lockdown, has your time been productive? I hope so. I hope you haven't just sat and spent the whole time watching TV. Now I've watched a little TV, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but has your time been productive? Paul's time in prison has been productive. He said earlier, he said, listen, because of my imprisonment, everyone's hearing the gospel, the whole Praetorian guard. And then he says something like, let's go over there and read it. He says something like, and, and everyone else. And I don't think he wanted at that very early part, let's go to Philippians chapter one. In that very early part, he didn't want to let the church know that he was talking about uh, people in Caesar's household coming to faith. I'm, I'm thinking Paul might have thought, wow, if I tell him in the beginning of my letter that some in Caesar's household have accepted Jesus, they might think I'm, I'm, I'm off and they might stop reading the book. So I better put it at the very end. <laughs> and so you notice it's the second to the last verse in Paul's letter. He puts it at the very, very end. So he wants to make sure they've read the entire letter before he tells them there's people in Caesar's households. It's our brothers and sisters that are saints. Yeah. All right, let's look at that. Philippians chapter one, uh, verses 12 and 13. He says, now I want you to know, brethren, remember Paul in prison, he's writing a letter. He's writing it to the church at Philippi. I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances has turned out for the greater process, progress of the gospel. He says, my imprisonment has been a good thing for the furtherance of the gospel. Verse 13, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian guard and to everyone else. Notice that, and to everyone else. I think he's talking about, and it's gone all the way up to Caesar's household. They have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Praetorian guards, some of them have gotten saved. They've told someone else. They've told someone else. The gospel has expanded into Caesar's own household. Hallelujah. So again, he could have written Caesar's household there, but I think he was scared. They would have said, forget it. <laughs> I ain't reading this book. I ain't reading this letter. But he saves it to the very end. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Can you imagine reading that in that day? They must have been blown away. Oh my gosh, you mean there are saints in Caesar's household. Well, let's look at these verses together as a group. Verse 21 and 22 it says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, and especially those of Caesar's household. Do you notice in just those verses, if you put them together and you look into them as we have just looked, that we are just one big weird family, amen? <laughs> so Paul says, saints in the church of Philippi, and you guys are living good moral lives, and you got it together, you're the church, and he says, then we got brothers and sisters who are prisoners. And then there's some of these guys in the Praetorian Guard who've accepted Jesus. And then there's even those that are in Caesar's household that have accepted Jesus. What a mixed up bunch of people. Uh, and we have nothing in common, church, but we have everything in common. Amen? I love CIPC. You know, I, I get to go around and preach at other churches a lot. And when I go... Uh, I don't see it in every church, but I do see in a lot of churches that there's kind of a lot of segregation. And a lot of that has to do with geography. Maybe you go into a certain church and, and they're kind of wealthy people. And you can tell, you know, just the way they dress, the cars they drive, uh, the neighborhood they live in, where the church is, the, the, the status of the church. Go into another church and you can tell it's very poor. Uh, and so, and so oftentimes, uh, those churches don't mix and sometimes they do. Let me tell you too. Sometimes I'm in churches that are very much like CIPC and they have a good variety of international folks and a good variety of different economic levels. And I, I think it's such a much more beautiful thing when the church is mixed, when we have the wealthy and the poor and we have people from different communities and we have different economic statuses among us and we have people from different ethnical backgrounds and at CIPC even different language backgrounds and different education levels and I really love CIPC um, and we don't want to be one kind of church we don't want to be a poor church and we don't want to be a rich church we want to be the saints of God that's made up of everything 
And we want to learn to figure out how to get along. How does a guy with a lot of resources get along with someone who's poor? How do we get along when we're from different uh, cultural backgrounds? Well, we've been able to figure that out beautifully at CIPC. I don't know that we figured it out or just the Holy Spirit has helped us. <laughs> I don't have any great strategies, but, but we have figured it out with the help of the Lord. And CIPC is just a beautiful place of a really, really mixed congregation. And I think that's what heaven's going to be like. So I love CIPC. I hope you love it. If you're watching us and you've never been to CIPC, then plan to join us on June 14th <laughs> when I hope we can be back together and have services again. So we're one big, weird, happy family. We are those who have nothing in common with each other, and yet we have everything in common with each other. Amen. And this is the joy of sainthood. Um, most of us are probably not an extreme level. In other words, not extremely wealthy or extremely poor or extremely educated or extremely uneducated. We're probably not in the extremes. We're somewhere in the middle would represent most of us. But when you accept Jesus, when you accept Jesus, you become a brother or sister, even with the extremes who have accepted Jesus. So even the most notorious criminal down here, this really evil guy, right? Whatever you think evil is, this really evil guy, but he's accepted Jesus and you're somewhere here in the middle. You know what? You've become his brother. You've become his brother in Christ, amen? And, and same in the middle here, there's this guy up here and he's a political leader or he's a millionaire, maybe a billionaire. This guy really a lot of status, right? Somebody who's, he accepts Jesus, guess what? You're his brother, amen? <laughs> and so this is the church that even, even though the most of us are gonna find us somewhere in the, in the middle, we're not extreme. When someone from the most extreme, whether high or low, comes to Jesus, they're still our brother in Christ, amen? They've become our brother and they've become a saint. Well, so as we accept Christ, we become one in Christ. Um, we become saints in the Lord and we become the family of God. Uh, we're about to close. I want to read a few scriptures to you about the family of God, and then we're going to read the last verse of Philippians. So let's go over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. This is probably one of my favorite. I really love the book of Romans. I really love this chapter 8, and boy, we could chew on the whole thing, but let's just look at verses 14 to 17. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. It says, for who, excuse me, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God these are the sons of God. Now, for all you ladies, that also means the daughters of God, okay? It doesn't write it that way, but sons or daughters. So let's read that again. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You see, if you've accepted Christ, he's given you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's leading you because you're a son or daughter of God. Verse 15, for you have not received a spirit of slavery. In other words, the Spirit of God doesn't come in and take control of you and force you to live a certain kind of lifestyle. No, he comes in, he guides you, he prompts you. If you want to sin, you can sin. The Holy Spirit's not going to stop you, but he's going to guide you. He's going to convict you. When you start to sin, he's going to say, you don't have to do that. Here's a way out. Amen. And so you can choose to sin or not sin. You're not under the power of sin. This is why I tell you, even if you've come under addiction, that addiction can be broken in the name of Jesus. Okay. Because the Holy Spirit's going to lead you out of that. Okay, you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba is an endearing term. It doesn't mean father in a uh, high kind of way, but it means an endearing way, uh, like my kids called me Papa. So it's like saying Papa God. So we replace Father with God and, and Abba with Papa. <laughs> it says, you've not received a spirit that's going to put you into slavery, but you've received the spirit of God that's going to cause you to identify yourself as a child of God, so much so that you will cry out and call Almighty God, Papa God. Hallelujah. <laughs> he's your Papa. It's an endearing term. It means he's close to you. He's dear to you. You love him. I loved it when I came home and my kids would jump up and down when they were tiny, of course, and they'd say, Papa's home, Papa's home, Papa's home. And so listen, Papa's home. Amen. All you have to do is cry out to the Lord and he is there for you. And then look at verse 16. How do you know you're a Christian? We dealt with this earlier. How do you know you're a Christian? How do you know you're a son of God? How do you know you're a daughter of God? Well, verse 16 tells you, the Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit in me, bears witness with our spirit 
that we are children of God. How you know you're children of God? Because I know. Prove it to me. I can't prove it to you. But the Holy Spirit, which God put in me, the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. It's who I am. Am I perfect? Not yet. <laughs> He's still working on me. Amen. But I'm still a child of God. I'm a saint. Have I done miracles? Have I qualified for Catholic canonization to be a saint? No, probably not. <laughs> I'm still a saint. Amen. I'm still a saint. You're still a saint if you're a follower of Jesus. Hallelujah. And so the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We are the saints of God. Okay, let's go over to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as receive him, that's Jesus, as many, as many who want to call upon the name of the Lord, Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Any man, woman, or child that has breath in their lungs, no matter their religious background, no matter their skin color, no matter their nationality, no matter what language they speak, no matter what, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anyone can choose to be a follower of Jesus. As many as receive him, to them he gave the right the power, the authority to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born, this is our second birth, not, not our first birth, birth, but being born again, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, wasn't a man and woman decided to have sex and have a baby, no, not the will of man, nor of the will of man, but of God of God's will. When you called upon the name of the Lord, you were born again. You're a child of God. You're a saint of God. And today we're talking about the joy of sainthood. That should make you happy. That should fill your life with joy. I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. 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 Last one. Go over to 1 John. 1 John. Way back in the back. 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, 1 John, there we go, 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 1. See how great a love the Father, Father God, Papa God, has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. You see, we're not just like, hey, you're forgiven. We use that word a lot, we're forgiven. Man, I am so much more than forgiven. I've been forgiven, yeah. But then I've been brought in. I've been adopted. I've been brought into the household. I've been brought into the family of God. Let's read that again. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. I'm a child of God. You're a child of God. Hallelujah. And look at this next verse. And such we are. <laughs> what a nice statement. And such we are. We are the children of God. For this reason, the world doesn't know us because it didn't know him. When it says it doesn't know us, it means like the world, other people, they might not recognize we're the children of God. We can say, hey, I'm a child of God. They're like, what does that even mean? You're a child of God. You got a mom and dad. No, I'm a child of God. I've been born again. Yeah, I was born to a man and a woman, but I was born of God also. Let's look at this verse two. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared yet what we shall be. And so God is still working on us. Amen? We have not yet fully appeared what we will, will be, but we are now children of God. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We'll be like Jesus because we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. That verse three is real important because we talk about the joy of sainthood and we talk about salvation and we talk about, do you know if you're a saint? Here's how you know. Not just the spirit bearing witness with your spirit, but are you pursuing holiness? When you sin, do you repent? Are you trying to change your behavior on an ongoing basis to root out sin and to bring in righteousness? Let's look at that one more time. And everyone who has this hope, what's the hope of seeing Jesus, 
of not just being a child now, but of being fully revealed of what we shall be, which is to be like Jesus when we see him. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him, fixed on Jesus, purifies, strives to live holy, repents of their sin, purifies himself just as he is pure. Hallelujah. Because we want to be like him. All right. Our very last verse today, Philippians chapter four, verse 23. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Praise the Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Um, don't you hate to end something good? I hate the last verse. We've come to the last verse and I hate it. Uh, this, this past week, Carol made chocolate semifredo. Oh my goodness, it was amazing. Do you know when I finished that, I had a spoon, it's kind of like an ice cream or chocolate mousse dish, and as I finished it, you know what, I could still see was some chocolate, and I took my finger, and I went around the bowl, uh, and I got, mm, I got every last bit of that semifredo. It was, it was awesome. Man, the book of Philippians has been awesome, amen? And I just wanna, I just wanna get that last bit, amen? <laughs> And so the last bit here, Philippians 4.23, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And so I leave you with this. Paul opened the book with grace and he ends the book with grace. Uh, there are two bookends of this book because grace is so important. For by grace are you saved. Amen. Amen. Grace is how we live our lives, by the grace of God. It's not by our strength. We don't even, we don't even, we're talking about holiness. We don't even arrive at this pursuit of holiness by our own strength. Oh, I'm gonna get sin out of my life. I'm gonna live holy. No, it's by the grace of God that we trust God, that every time we sin, we don't just say, I repent. We pray and we say, God, give me strength that I don't do that sin again, that I change my behavior, I change my mind, renew my mind, I change my behavior. It's all by the power of his grace, not the power of my might, but the power of his grace. Amen. And so every Sunday, as we're going to do in just a few minutes, we close out our sermon with a benediction and we say, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us. And when I put grace up on the big screen in church, or we've even been putting it on the video, I always spell out grace, G-R-A-C-E in capital letters with a little dash between them. If you're new with us, you may not know what that means, but if you've been with us a while, I think you already know what that means. That we do that to remind you that grace, we know what grace is, and in the church we often say it's unmerited favor, but we have an acronym we like to use as grace, and that is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches. You get all the blessings of heaven. When you die, you get to go be with the Lord. Jesus said, I'm preparing a place for you. And if I go, I'm going to come back. I'm going to receive you to myself that where I am there, you may be also God's riches, all the riches of heaven for your life at Christ's expense. It can be given to you because Christ went to the cross for you. God's riches at Christ's expense. Um, our title today is The Joy of Sainthood. Saints, we would not be saints without grace. It is his grace that causes us to be saints. It's his riches, the richness of his righteousness given to us, not by our acts, but by the act of Christ on the cross. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, as we close today, I just want to ask you again, as I've asked in other sermons in this series, and that is, are you a saint? In other words, have you given your life to Jesus Christ and are you following him? If you are not, would you pray with me today? Would you give your life to Jesus? Are you ready to do that, to say, I'm gonna forget my religion, I'm gonna forget my upbringing, I'm gonna forget the pursuit of the world, and I'm gonna lay my life down I'm gonna give up everything, and Jesus, I'm gonna follow you. If you're ready to do that, pray this prayer with me today. It's not a magical prayer, but if you'll repeat it, and you'll not repeat it as in just repeating it, but you will say it to God, he will hear your prayer. He'll forgive you of your sins, and you will be a saint this very day. 
So everyone who wants to pray that prayer with me, would you bow your head right now? And if you don't need to pray that prayer, would you just pray for other people watching this video who might need to pray this prayer that they would be praying and giving their lives to Jesus right now? So all of you need to pray that. Would you pray with me right now? And say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And today, I confess that I have sinned against you. And today, I repent of all my sins, and I ask you to forgive me. Jesus, I invite you, come into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior. I want to live for you, and in your name I pray, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you're born again, hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer, you are a saint of God. Your sins are removed. The Holy Spirit has come in to fill your life and to begin to guide you. Learn to follow him. Read your word. Pray every day. As soon as church starts, come join us for church. <laughs> Until then, join us for our video next week. But get in the church. Get in the word. Get into prayer. Begin to listen to that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. It'll begin to lead you in a life of purifying your life and walking with the Lord. Well, church, it's been great to be with you again. I hope you are experiencing the joy of sainthood, that there is nothing better in this whole world than being a follower of Jesus. Amen? <laughs> and so I hope you know the joy of sainthood. Uh, let me pray for you before we go, and then we'll say the benediction. Father, I thank you for each one watching. I thank you for those who prayed that prayer today, giving their life to you. And I pray they do feel the weight of sin removed and the infilling of your Holy Spirit and, and that they'll begin to sense the leading of the Holy Spirit in their life and they will begin to follow. God, I pray you put a passion in their heart to read your word, to pray, to go to church and to seek you and to seek your ways and to begin walking in your ways, Lord. Father, for everyone watching today, I pray that they would know the joy of saying to it, even if they're going through a hard time right now with coronavirus and maybe loss in their life. Maybe some are even struggling. They don't have enough food. Father, I pray that no matter how hard their struggle is, they would know the joy of saying to it. They would know I am a child of God. Let them know that right now in their heart. Bless each one watching, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, say the benediction with me as we go. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord. Be back with us again next week by video. Again, if you have children, check out Carol's children's videos. You're gonna love those for your kids. There's a lot of craft items in there you can do with the kids and you'll have a great time with, it, with them. So again, have a great day and have a great week in the, in the Lord and we'll see you next week. God bless you. Bye-bye.